My skin is all nipples. You guys are absolutely insane. BR Live, we are out here. You cannot mention Austria without talking about Red Bull. Red Bull started here. And ever since they became a multinational corporation, they've been making their mark in media and music and now football. In 2005, they took over Austria Salzburg, raising eyebrows in the football world. Of course, look, easy to have an opinion if you're removed, if you're on the internet. So we're gonna introduce you to some people that live through the takeover to see what they think. Sorry, gotta catch my breath. BR Live, we'll see you. In my former career as a professional baseball player, my life was built around speed. Sprinting 90 feet with reckless abandon to steal a base gave me a rush unlike anything I've ever experienced. But with baseball behind me, my attention turned to finding a slower burning version of that feeling. I traveled to Japan with the goal of achieving that mental state. Tatsumi brought me on a mountain entry, requesting silence and reflection as we traveled. It's different than hikes that I've done because I'm focusing on something. I think other hikes that you do, you're just focusing on exercising, getting there to the mountain. But we were there the whole time, having something to focus on that's outside of yourself and what you're doing, where you're getting to, what's happening next. That's a high in and of itself. Only a few minutes left in extra time and they're going to bar to check. Oh! oh my God! Hello friends, we are out here in Porto. AS Roma coming to town to face FC Porto. The city is dope, do not sleep on it. Champions League match day five, no better place to be than with this man and the rest of the Collectif Ultras Paris. With Mbappe and Neymar both questionable, their role is massive. A club with so much money has to win a Champions League, but first, you gotta get to that knockout stage. Don't miss it. TNT, BR Live. What's your fighting style? Uh, nerd rage. Nerd rage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can never really have enough of that. The lifelong of nerd rage to deal with, you know. You can never have enough therapy. You can never have enough therapy. See, look at my smile. It's, it's a real one. No, you're glowing Micah. right now. You have yeah, this glow <laughs> emanating from you. So you compete with your husband, yes. right? And this is your honeymoon. We are out here in Barcelona, the waviest city in Spain. Perhaps no better football city or country in the entire world. And perhaps nobody in the world better embodies physical dexterity and innate gifts than Leo Messi. But this story is about those without those gifts. Two brilliant men, one deaf and blind, and his friend that helps him see, hear, and feel the most beautiful game in the world. You're a kid that's into everything. You like basketball, you like technology, you like music. How does it escalate? How are you here now? Oh, my man Yams, long live ASAP Yams. He showed me how to facilitate. You feel me? So tell me about your record. I don't, I don't want to talk about it too much. I just want to let the, the music speak for itself. You know, I've been working on it my whole life, but I've been recording it for the past five years. You know what I'm saying? So You've been recording this record for five years? Yeah, five years. I'm not in no rush to do nothing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Money. Oh. 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 The intensity uh, went up a little bit. Thought we were gonna have a nice little casual game, catching elbows, getting boxed out. Two weeks, you're going to spring training. If you don't have a job, I mean, it's time to read the tea leaves and say, you gotta sign something. Yeah, I mean, I sort of know what it feels like, but I never really knew what it felt like because I never had a job <laughs> at this point <laughs> in the year, and I was just very happy to go to spring training and see all my friends, the famous players. I still see myself as a, as a normal boy. He's just, just playing football, really. Except that you, <laughs> you're 19 and you played in the World Cup. Yeah. <laughs> We're settling into the first decades of the 21st century, and racism is still a part of our culture. Despite the steep modernization of football, racism still lingers in stadiums across Europe. Bayern Munich were not always the biggest club in Germany. They won nothing in the early 1900s. 
But in 1932, a former player turned president, Kurt Landauer, led Bayern to its first national championship. A year later, however, the club was nearly destroyed. Landauer passed away in 1961, so he didn't get a chance to see the club he helped build go on to become domestic and European champions so many times over. But when his legacy at Bayern was unearthed, his club supporters made certain that anti-fascism would be a part of the most storied club in Germany's identity. We're here in Paris to see one of the most pivotal matches of the group stage. But we're also here to report on one of modern football's complicated marriages between ultras groups and their clubs. The absolutely cowardly behavior of just a few fans at Greece's Olympic Stadium is exactly how ultras groups do not want to be portrayed. We were actually in that very stadium just a few weeks ago. And we saw one of the most incredible shows of support that I've ever seen. And we're talking organized force, not reckless aggression. Before the opening whistle in Athens, I saw one of the most moving images I've ever seen in any sport, in any stadium. Ike fans at their best, an image we wanted to leave you with. An example of what modern football should look like and exactly what we came here to see in Paris. Could you take us to some of the more interesting moments, say, of Phil's career that you have sort of a unique perspective of as that number one spectator? You know, when Phil won the Masters in 2004, we had this kind of personal feeling about the 16th hole there. And it didn't necessarily add up, but we decided to kind of take a flyer on how we thought that hole played. And, and you know, he knocked in a 20-footer for two a few minutes later to tie himself for the lead, and ultimately won, you know, 15 minutes later with a birdie on 18 to win his very first major and his very first Masters. Okay, I'm gonna try to caddy for you on this hole. All right, talk to me. So uh, you should just hit the hell out of it toward those bunkers, and then uh, you're doing great. You're handsome. <laughs> very nice. All right. Let me grab that for you, sir. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Humans have been drawing on the walls for ages, so it should come as no surprise that here in Athens, the cradle of Western civilization, the graffiti culture is so advanced. It's a friendly. There's technically nothing at stake here. It's just a festival to have a festival. Are you incensed? <laughs> have you been offended? <laughs> Are, have you been offended? <laughs> if you hit a home run off me, I can be sad. My feelings can be hurt. And then I can decide to throw an object at your head. <laughs> That's why when we sit here in round tables and talk about the unwritten rules and say they shouldn't exist, it doesn't matter because ultimately the players, for, they enforce it themselves. A lot of people, we've talked about a lot on the show, think there are too many unwritten rules in baseball yep. and it's preventing the sport from modernizing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's making in general a, a product. If you look at that bottled gift product that is sold on shows like this in ESPN, it's just not as interesting. It's boring. If I was in charge of the league, what I would do is I would call a round table with the players, the, with everybody and say, look, we're all holding each other back. Let's just get over our feelings. We could have Drake help us, whatever. I actually tried to study journalism at Columbia as an undergrad. And when I got there, I was admitted. And when I got there, I realized that it was not an undergrad option. So I then decided to study creative writing uh, and American studies. Uh, American studies is as close as, as you can get to undecided while still having a major. Um, it's not my joke. It's a joke of the great actor Roger Gwenver Smith who studied American. You know Roger? Yeah. I know him personally. Special guy. There's someone in there. I might need to take this shot after that one. How does one become a fighter? We've seen all of these documentaries about how it started. Maybe you grow up near a gym, your dad's a boxer, something like that. Your first fight, is it not even a professional one? How do you become you? Um, well, when I was 28, I didn't start boxing until I was 28 years old. I was going through a divorce and living with my kid sister and both of our kids, working all these jobs. And my sister brought me a gift certificate to go to a karate school. And she was like, I'm tired of looking at your face. You have to do something other than work. 
And they asked me within like three weeks of training if I wanted to have a fight. And my mama always said, ain't nobody ever gonna beat you like your mama. So <laughs> I said, I'll try it. You know, I was, yeah. I was in a rough time in my life and I beat up this girl so bad. And <laughs> it was the first time I ever felt like I was good at anything. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? <laughs> really not very hard, I'm just yelling. <laughs> 